Yeah. I'll, I'll say. You'll, you'll, you'll say. Have to me. Um, it's just a real Harry. pleasure. He hasn't Harry. been. He hasn't been here for for many years since before COVID, and uh, so it's very nice to have him back. Uh, he's really busy, so he's only able to be here for a short amount of time. Let's please give your undivided attention to uh, Dr. Uli. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Seawald, Rabbi Smith. They uh, really try to bring the best to this, uh, you know, yeshiva. And uh, this is probably the only yeshiva. I, I lecture in other high schools, but this is the only yeshiva that actually looks for people who are very interesting and tries to basically give it to their students. So kudos to you guys for doing this. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, the way I'm going to talk about this is basically give us a brief intro. Do show and tell, uh, inspirational story, one or two of them, or three or four, depending on how much you want, and the rest is time for questions. So what is an orthopedic surgeon? Orthopedic surgeon depends on who you ask. If you ask someone under 20, with some of you guys here, they think it's something with the teeth, maybe something with the feet, maybe with something with the mattress, ortho, they have no idea what it is. If you ask someone above 40, they know what an orthopedic surgeon is because most of the times they have to have something done or God forbid if someone had a trauma, they need an orthopedic surgeon. So orthopedic surgeon is basically a surgeon that takes care of any of the issues that have to do with the muscles or bones, okay? Within orthopedic surgery, there's seven subspecialties, okay? So there is a joint specialist that replaces total joints and I'm that. There's a sports doctor, I also do that as well. There's spine, there's pediatrics, Okay, there's tumor, they take care of oncology. There's a lot of other areas in orthopedics that you do a specialty. So how do you get to be an orthopedic surgeon from high school? Just to give you a little snapshot of what it takes is it's four years of college, four years of medical school. And I see someone with the Cornell uh, jersey. So um, I went to Cornell Medical School and five years of orthopedic surgical residency and internship, I did at NYU at New York. And then one additional year of fellowship uh, out here in LA doing um, arthroscopic surgery, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Thanks. So if you hear all those things, and I finished that 20 years ago, you ask a question, and most people, when I say I'm orthopedic surgeon, they see I have a yarmulke, a beard, I, uh, you know, I'm a Lubavitcher. The first question they ask is, so when did you become a Baal Tshuva? It's a legitimate question. Nowadays, Baruch Hashem, you know, there are people who are going through the system and then become professionals in this sort of realm that takes multiple years of training and school and everything like that. But back when I started, there was very few individuals. And uh, if I were to give a lecture to Yoek, for example, they wouldn't let me because it would be not, not sanctioned. Um, but, you know, I went through the system as I spoke to some of you. I know your fathers, I was roommates with some of them. I went to Yeshiva with them. And I went through the system. We can talk more about that, but I just want to give you a snapshot of what an orthopedic surgeon is. You know, when we say brachas in the morning, we say zeikiv kafufim. God makes people who are bent over and he makes them straight. So orthopedic surgeon is basically the shliach that we're allowed to take people who are deformed. Um, literally, ortho means a deformity and you correct the deformity. So what I'm going to show you is some images, x-rays of people with fractures and uh, I'll actually show you what we do. And when people ask me what, you know, uh, medical questions, I say, I'm not really a medical doctor, I am an MD, but I'm really a carpenter, I'm a human carpenter. And you'll get an idea of what that means. And I also wanna talk about some areas in orthopedics that are not people who are doctors, but there are, you know, if you like this area, and there are a lot of people who've heard this before, um, they go into this sort of area. I have. PAs or physician assistants who work with me that do three years of uh, training in a PA school. And, um, you know, they're very happy with their job. It's very lucrative. And it's not crazy the way I discuss the path with you that takes literally 14 years of school to get to this point. Okay. I've been in Kaiser now 15 years. Um, we have a member of 10 orthopedic surgeons and I was made the chief uh, seven years ago. So just to give you a sort of who I am. Um, and this is a typical 
I like to start with this because if you're in high school and a lot of kids like to punch the walls, they get upset. But you know, if you do that, it may not be that easy as just need a cast. We do all the casting and everything like that. Orthopedic surgeons generally don't get into the nitty gritty of that. We have technicians who are cast technicians who do that. But if someone needs surgery and you can see this is a broken you know, metacarpal, which is one of the bones in the wrist, that ends up needing a small plate and screws. Each of the plates that we use for every single one of the parts of the body, for example, this is a wrist fracture, and you can see it's broken here, gets a dedicated plate, screws, and not only that, in the actual um, operating room, we have a technician who does x-rays. So we have a whole series of things, and just for show and tell, and you guys come up later, and I'll take questions later, is this is literally a plate. All these are uh, clean, they were sterilized, but they were actually in patients. Uh, we put them on and like didn't fit properly, so we took it out, but once you put it in a patient, you sort of buy it. So now I have a show and tell collection, but this is literally a plate. It's special in terms of what it is. It's usually titanium, so you could go through x-rays and not really have them sort of, uh, you know, <coughs> sign and, uh, and they're not gonna react with the areas around the bone. Um, this is specifically for the next x-ray that I'm gonna show you guys is an ankle fracture. And this plate was used in the ankle. And this is the image that we take after. Surgery takes around an hour, hour and a half, depending on the surgery. And you see these type of screws on the inner side. These are screws that uh, are what we call cannulated, so the special screws that are, you know, have hollow. And the reason why is because we take a pin, we put it where we think we need it, so you have to do a little bit of target practice, you get good at that. And then once you like that, then you put the screw over the uh, wire. So this is the actual screw that would go into the inner part of the ankle. And uh, I used to take care of a lot of patients who had clavicle fracture, a lot of cyclists. I'm a cyclist myself. I do a lot of bike for high uh, fundraisers. So um, this is a broken clavicle. Not all of them need uh, surgery, but this is another image of a broken clavicle that gets plate and screws. Just to give you an idea of the reason why it takes so much training, right under this bone here is the great vessels, the subclavian vessels, which basically are feeding right into the vessels that go into the heart. So God forbid if you're doing a drill, right, and you go a little bit too deep, you could really create someone to a catastrophic bleed that they have to get vascular surgeon and crack the chest. So this is not something that's just carpentry. There's uh, high stakes involved, and usually these are young, healthy patients. That's one of the reasons why I was pulled to orthopedic surgery is we don't de deal with people who are ill. We don't deal with people who have, God forbid, terminal illnesses. We deal with functional people who either got broken and they need to get fixed, or in a minute, I'll show you some other stuff that I do. So back in the day when I was your age and we were doing training, these are literally x-rays that we actually had to get in the operating room. And if you could see, we had to look towards the light. We had a light box. You guys have no idea what that stuff is. Um, but you can see a both bone forearm fracture. This is the before, and this is in the surgery. We actually use an x-ray, and this is the sort of copy that comes out. And you can see two plates that are put on the forearm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you get the idea of what we do. And there are people in the operating room who are x-ray technicians, that's what they do. They go in, they wear lead. Um, we wear lead when we do surgery, when we fix bones, when we need x-rays. Um, and uh, it's another sort of thought that people have no idea what it is to be associated with this type of industry. This is an example of a hip fracture. The way we fix hip fractures is very unique. We put a rod right through the femur and you can see this would be a representation of the rod that goes right into the femur. And, you know, orthopedic surgeons like to be creative, so this color is lime, okay? I think it is. But it's lime, and the reason is because we know, and it's actually curved like the femur is, a little bit of a bow there. Um, but the reason why it's lime is because the left side is lime, the right side is rose. So we have different colors, and it actually because you have to get this screw oriented the cor correct way, so you have to have the left side and the right side, so we have color coded. We also do with, uh, you know, God forbid, cancer. This is a lady who had metastatic breast cancer that went both to both hips, and uh, she came in. We 
uh, did surgery on her um, to stabilize her femur, stabilize her hips, and she was able to go home the next day. She lived for a couple years after that, but she needed this surgery to basically stabilize her uh, femur before she would break it. Um, so that's the, some of the stuff that we do as well. Some of you guys here, uh, they talk about growth plates, growing pains. Um, this is a knee of, uh, I think a 16 year old kid. And you can see the squiggly lines here and here. Those are the growth plates, that's where the bone grows from. So when we do surgery, we have to be really careful um, to avoid those spots because if we go through those growth plates, it actually changes the way they grow and they could actually have a limb length discrepancy. So that's something that we like to show in distinction or in contrast to this. This is the bread and butter that, of what I do. This is a patient who walks around with a limp, a cane, hip and knee arthritis is this sort of thing that I do. This is the uh, show and tell stuff that I have here. So you see bone on bone arthritis. And then we go in, it takes around two hours to do the surgery and we resurface the bone. Replacement sounds kind of scary and I tell the patient it's not really replacing. We go in like a dentist. If you go to your dentist and they say you need a, you know, you have a tooth that has multiple cavities and uh, a filling is not gonna work. What's the next step? They do a crown. So a crown is they smooth down the tooth, they give you some numbing medicine and they put a cap on it. So this is the same idea of what we do in a knee replacement. So just to say, this was in someone's femur. This is the part that is, here's a side profile, that goes on the femur. And this is something that covers the bone completely. And then when someone walks on it, it's not rubbing bone on bone, it's what we call articulating, or this is another type of substance that's very um, long lasting, it's called oxidium, it's an alloy. The interesting thing in residency, we actually have to learn the study of metals how metals interact with the body. Because if you don't know that stuff, you could potentially put something that could cause erosion. So this is a knee replacement picture. And here is a person with hip arthritis. And this is an x-ray of someone having hip. So let me just tell you that hip surgery, hip, ar hip uh, replacement surgery is 98% good to excellent results. They last for 25, 30 years. And not only that, when you come into your office and you see patients with hip and knee arthritis, you have changed their lives. Not just a little bit, but dramatically. They're out of pain, they're functional, and they literally want to come and hug you because you have changed their lives. That's what I do day to day, and I'm blessed to be able to do that. And here is a sort of a type of different model. Sometimes we use these implants, we put bone cement in there, and then we basically hold it. This is a different type of substance where you could see and later on you could uh, feel it, but this is rough. And it has a material called hydroxyapatite that the bone actually grows into it and it fuses with the bone. And it lasts literally for the life of the patient typically. Um, coming and winding down to our show and tell, this is uh, arthroscopic surgery. What I do and uh, half of my patients are younger patients who have sports injuries. So we do surgery. Um, through tiny little poke holes. And the surgery is actually done on a screen um, that you can actually visualize everything. And these are the images that are coming from that. So um, someone who tears a rotator cuff, you're not opening the shoulder, you're actually doing what we call triangulation. So you're basically having to know how to operate, looking at a two dimensional thing using three dimensions. And what we do is we basically, and this is a couple of different models of um, little anchors. These are synthetic material that goes into your bone with stitches attached So we bring the tissue there and it becomes part of your bone within a year. So this grows and goes into your bone, becomes part of the bone. And if you look at this image, you can see the rotator cuff tendon getting fixed, going into the hole where the shoulder is to fix that torn tendon. And this is not an open surgery, this is done arthroscopically. And that um, skill set took me another year to actually uh, master um, after my five years of training. I do a lot of ACL surgery and just as a representation of ACL surgery, a lot of you may know people who've had ACL surgery. This is someone who basically had an area that the tendon was supposed to be in there or the ligament. And we basically go in 
we harvest, that means we take a part of their tendon and we turn it into the ACL. That's in their knee, not cutting open their knee, but done arthroscopically. And these are some of the um, you know, tools that we use. And uh, we work with physical therapists. That's another area that a lot of people show interest in. We work with nurses that are dedicated to orthopedics. And um, it's a very rewarding um, uh, you know, industry. One of the things that you know, people don't realize is all these um, sort of implants is what we call them. The, um, you know, this could, if you have, you know, if you need a weapon, this is pretty good too. Um, but the people who actually smell, uh, sell this equipment, it's called Smith & Nephew, Arthrex, a lot of different companies, they actually come into the operating room and they are the people who are saying, you know, doc, what size do you need? They open the box, they give it to the nurse, the nurse is sterile, gives it to um, the uh, doctor. So when I'm doing a knee replacement, just to give you context, in the room, there's an anesthesia doctor, there's myself as a physician assistant, there's a scrub tech, the person who's basically helping me do the actual surgery, and sometimes there's another scrub tech, um, there's an x-ray technician in the room, and then there's an OR scrub nurse that basically runs around, make sure everything's safe. And uh, I'll sort of close out with this, is before um, we start any type of surgery, there's a timeout in life, you need like, you know, stop what you're doing, what, what's your intent? What side are you doing? And it's very serious. You have to basically uh, record that you did a timeout. Um, and, and it's a good metaphor for life um, that everything that you do, you have to be uh, with intention. You have to be mindful of what you're doing. And I also find that a very interesting thing, and this is also a Hasidist thing, is there's a surgery that we do, it's called microfracture. If someone has an area where the cartilage on the uh, bone, let's say this is a nice 15 year old kid's bone, and you see the cartilage is beautiful inside the knee, it looks pristine, it's white. But let's say there's an area where the cartilage is missing, we go and we do a microfracture surgery, which means we go inside, we uh, perforate the marrow, so stem cells come out, and then they grow um, into cartilage. So, you know, sometimes you have to break it to allow it to start healing. That's not just in life, but it's also in physically uh, in the actual body during surgery. Um, so this is the part of my show and tell. Um, I'd like to share a couple of stories with you. And then afterwards, if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to, uh, to oblige. So one of the things that people uh, ask me a lot is, you know, how were you able to go through this uh, being Shomer Shabbos? Um, you know, surgery is pikuach uh, nefesh. So we learned uh, last parsha of Achai Behem, you're allowed to do surgery on Shabbos, but there's a lot of things in the training that do not allow you to do, and how were you able to get through it? So this is an example. The story that I, I uh, like to share is that when I started my first year in orthopedic surgery, NYU Hospital for Joint Diseases, which is around the corner for you New Yorkers to Beth Israel on 17th Street between 16th and 17th between 1st and 2nd Avenue, um, that's where the Rebbe by Gimel Kamas is in Beth Israel around the corner from that, by that park. Where we stand. Uh, I'm dating myself, mm -hmm. but I'm actually older than you. So, um, no, before the, yeah. So, um, yeah, Baruch Hashem. The, um, the residency program had a test that was given on Shabbos. I didn't know about it, but it was a required test. It's like the, you know, finals for all the uh, orthopedic surgeons. Just to give you an idea of how many orthopedic surgeons in this in the, in the country are are graduating every year, there's 550 of us that graduate a year for America. So approximately one orthopedic surgeon for 10,000 individuals. So if you have a group of 10, you're servicing a lot of people. Um, so they said there's a test that's given on Shabbos. There was a fifth year resident, he's called the chief resident, comes over to me and says, um, you know, Ruby, I'm from, uh, you, you know, you have to, he wasn't wearing a yarmulke, he was modern orthodox, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful person. And he says, you know, you're gonna have to take the test on, on Shabbos. So I told him, uh, you know, I do surgery on Shabbos, I'm not taking any tests on Shabbos. And it was six months before the actual test. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not gonna deal with it because I'm not taking it. A month before, I see everybody studying for it, and I'm like, I'm not gonna take it. Um, and he was telling me six months before, he says, you know, I asked the uh, chairman of the, uh, hospital, 
you know, can I take this test on Sunday? And they said, no, the test has to go back immediately once you guys take it. And uh, I had to take it on Shabbos. So he's like, you're gonna have a problem. So a month before, closer to three weeks before the test, I was um, uh, summoned to the uh, chairman's office. I did not contact him. I did not ask him. I just was not gonna take it and see what happens. Um, he brings me into his office, asks me questions, how's the, the training going? And this is just to give you an idea of when you do orthopedic uh, surgery internship and uh, you know all the interviews for it, one of the things is they ask you is like, how much can you bench press? It's a very like boys club. Now they're trying to change their image a little bit. Um, but, and back then, in, 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 around the time, uh, I think five years after I did my training, they changed the rules. It used to be, that used to be 110, 120 hours working. We, we really, like slave labor. Uh, so he asked me, how am I doing? How's everything? How's my family? I was married with kids then. And then he says, so what are you gonna do about the in-training test? And I didn't answer him, I just looked at him. He says, you know, I see you wearing a yarmulke. And uh, he said that. And he says, uh, I want you to come to my office at seven o'clock in the morning, Monday morning. Uh, we're gonna have you do the test. And then when you're finished, we're gonna submit it. It's gonna be a little late, but it's gonna be fine to the board, or orthopedic board, boards. So I did that for five years. And one of the lessons that you learn is, you know, when you walk around and you try to show that you're a proud Jew, then a lot of things happen with Bittachon that you wouldn't have otherwise. So this guy who was the chief resident, they don't have a yarmulke, it's a beautiful person, but he didn't have the image that uh, the chairman could see that he was Shoma Shabbos. So therefore he's like, it doesn't seem like you're Shoma Shabbos, so take the test. Um, so that's one of the stories that I had. And one of the stories that uh, gives me a lot of, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, I'm not gonna say Nechama, but it gives me a lot of, uh, you know, energy is when I was in um, high school, I uh, was told by my uh, teacher, Rabbi Shvei Yol Shalom, that I had to become a shleah. He was pushing me to become a shleah. So, so obviously, uh, you know, fast forward 15 years later, I was doing rounds on Shabbos with my scrubs, and he was there, he had hip fracture surgery, and he was there with his son, and I walked into the room, and uh, he recognized me, so I said, Rabbi Shvei, you remember you were trying to tell me to become a shleah? And he says, I was. I didn't think you'd be a shliach like this, but you're a shliach. You're in the hospital, you're helping people, and this is your shlichus. Everybody has their shlichus. It's not, you know, he basically turned it in a way, but, but, you know, and he was so proud to introduce him uh, to me, to his son, who was there on Shabbos, and it was like on Shabbos, and um, uh, that's one of the stories that I have. I have a lot of other stories. I'm happy to answer questions. I'll give you one other, uh, uh, I actually shared this in my shul uh, last uh, two weeks ago, um, because when I do surgery on Shabbos, I'm always grappling with the fact that even though it's 20 years after the fact that I'm a physician, but it's still, it's difficult for me to, um, you know, Hatzalim members are, are a different breed. I'm not like that. I, <laughs> I don't, uh, if there's a doctor on the plane and they call for a doctor, I'm not the person who runs up. That's not my sort of uh, game. Um, because I'm also a carpenter. So God forbid, if there's trauma, I take care of that. So uh, it was a uh, Friday night call I got late at night with a very, very terrible hand trauma. And uh, one of the fingers, uh, to my estimation, needed to be amputated. So I have a hand specialist uh, in my group, but he happened to be in Berlin running a marathon. I just remember these specific details. So I called another uh, hand specialist and he wasn't available as well. So I'm thinking to myself, I do hip, knee, and shoulder, that's my specialty, but this, this injury is so severe, I have to go in and take care of it, but it's probably gonna end up being an amputation of uh, some of the fingers. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I get up early, I was, uh, before surgery, I'm sipping a cup of coffee, Friday, uh, Shabbos morning, uh, around four o'clock in the morning, and you know how it is, you don't have your phone, this is like six years ago, you can't look at anything. So I said, okay, we never get our mail, I, let me go out to the mail, see, you know, what to read, because you have a coffee, you have to read something. Um, so I, I get the mail, and on the orthopedic journal, the magazine that orthopedic surgeons get, it says, a big picture, and it says, novel is a new, a new way to uh, implement trauma reconstruction on this type of injury. And this type of injury was the specific injury that I had to go in to take care of that would basically prevent amputation. So. What I'm, what I'm seeing is basically a, a, a manual that I'm seeing the Shabbos that I'm gonna go in and take care of this person. 
of how to really not amputate this individual, but really save his finger or fingers uh, from, from amputation. So not only did I read it and implement it and do it and got, thank God, saved uh, this guy's uh, fingers, but it was basically a sign for me that saying that, you know, God is making sure that you're at, you should be at peace with the fact that sometimes you have to go in on Shabbos, even though I hate to do all that. I like to, if there's anything that I could push and delay till after Shabbos, I do that. Uh, but it was basically another uh, thing that I could look for inspiration to, um, to really say that, you know, sometimes you have to actually do what you need to do on Shabbos. And this was a sign that God was showing me, not only am I telling you to do it, but I'm going to show you how to do the best possible way. So that's another story. I could go on and on and on with stories, but I'm gonna, uh, one more story we'll give you. One more story, and then we'll take questions. I go for a half hour, I start like three minutes late, right? I'm a yakka. You know what they say, when you take a, a Lubavitcher and you take a yakka and you put them together, what do you have? Mashiach that comes on time. All right, whatever. It's all good, it's all good. So there used to be, um, <laughs> every year there's a meeting of orthopedic surgeons is called the uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons a Convention. Uh, they come over from all over the world uh, to basically do a convention. So on, um, after the meeting, which is usually on Shabbos or Sunday, depending on the day, they basically have a run. I used to do a lot of running and triathlete. So they used to have a big run and uh, they used to have it on Sunday. One year, they basically, half a year before the event, they said, we're gonna do the run on Saturday. So I said, you know, why are you doing it on Saturday? So, you know, they, they said, you know, we didn't think about it that much, but zoning's a little bit easier, um, just go ahead um, and, and do it on Saturday. I said, no, I'm Shomo Shabbos. And, you know, I think it's a, so I asked the head of the uh, organization, I said, you know, I'm Shomo Shabbos, can you do me a favor, can you do it on Sunday? And sometimes if you just ask, doesn't matter what uh, you know the in, you know request is. This was like a running thing, so it's not a big deal. They're like, sure, we'll change. So they change the whole venue to do on Sunday. And sometimes you just have to be proud. You just have to ask, and then things will 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 will, will fall into place. Um, so, in a nutshell, this is what I do, um, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you uh, have. Um, I would say that the only sort of disclaimer that I do is anything that has to do with your own specific injury or pain, we're going to put that on the side and we're basically not here to have a, you know, small little clinic. We ha we're here to teach you guys about things. When I ask you uh, uh, to, to, to say your question, then just say who you are and where you're from. So we're going to start with the back row. We start from my uh, side over here. Uh, what's your name? My name is Michael Goldstein from California. Very nice. Um, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, first of all, what happens if you're exposed to radiation and x-rays? Like so, so that's a very good question. Uh, on the x-ray um, uh, sort of lead that we wear, there's a um, sort of marker. It's called um, a dissonometer and we actually wear it, and every year we give it in. So if the radiation goes too high, we actually have to um, you know, do certain protocols. But oh, the so bottom line is- It tests the radiation levels. Yeah, it tastes the, but it, the goal with every surgeon is to do the, let's say hip surgery with the minimum amount of x-rays, okay? So we take five x-rays, six x-rays, not too many. The doctors who do a lot of uh, x-rays are the ones who do angiograms that the in interventional cardiologists do, where they basically uh, insert a dye into the veins, and then under live x-ray, it basically shows an image. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Um, and those are high, high risk for uh, a lot more uh, radiation exposure. And we wear lead on our uh, throat because, uh, you know, in early days, a lot of the surgeons did get cancers. Um, so it's one of the worst hazards. Um, and uh, we actually, in the state of California, we actually have to do a license in fluoroscopy. So it's another level of you know, accreditation that you need. Um, so it's a, it's a concern. Um, it's one of those work hazard things, but um, when someone is pregnant, then they basically have to stop doing a certain type of surgery sometimes. Um, that's why there are not so many ladies in orthopedic surgery. Um, and my second question is, have you ever worked with Dr. Strange? 
Doctor Strange. <laughs> Somehow I know that. Are you both seen from uh, San Diego? No. No. Um, Where are you from? San Jose. San Jose. Okay. Oh. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, very nice. I knew I'd see looked familiar. There is, uh, in New York, there was a uh, orthopedic surgeon who was, uh, he had a, his last name was Dr. Bone, and there was a pain doctor as Dr. Hertz, H-E-R-T-T. -T. So it's funny how certain people go into certain areas. last name is Hertz, you should get into pain management. Yeah. All right, but that's a good question. Next, what's your name? Uh, Sean C. Dyes from Sydney. Okay. Um, what happened to the guy who was with you in, who was ship, who didn't wear a kip and wanted So he to was five years ahead of me. Uh, he's a spine surgeon now. He's a great guy. And uh, nothing happened to him. <laughs> what should happen to him? No, he was just what? telling me that, um, you know, I'm going to end up taking the test on Shabbos because he had to. He requested to take it on a different day, but they didn't let him. By the time, so it's a five-year residency program. It was his last year. I was coming in, so he was giving me advice, saying you're going to have a problem. Uh, so that, so actually, when I graduated, there was um, a person coming in uh, who is, um, you know, from, and he was able to take the test in the same on the top of um, the hospital. I remember the beautiful view. You know, back then you could see the twin towers um, and taking the test and the uh, I'm dating myself a little bit. Yes. Uh, What's your name? Arn Markowitz from Ice. Very nice. Um, first of all, what is the secret to your vascularity? Vascularity? What does vascularity mean? Your veins, Father. My veins. So, so <laughs> the reason I so this is from my grandfather, Ola Shalom. So he was very uh, vascular. But I think you're not asking that. I think you're asking. It looks like I'm a little bit fit. So, so I, so I <laughs> exercise daily. I exercise daily. Uh, my wife thinks it's a little bit too much, but uh, I do a lot of cycling. Um, but I get up very early. I get up before four, and I usually exercise for 90 minutes, um, usually indoor uh, racing and, and, and stuff like that. And then I do um, you know, fundraising um, in terms of bike for Kai, so I, I raise a lot of money for them. And one of the things that I do is also we do these competitive sports or cycling. Um, so uh, that's, that's what I do. I, go to, I don't sleep that much. I never did. When I was in Montreal Yeshiva, I was um, the person who basically opened up the lights in the base measures. Uh, it was dark outside, but I was sitting with, that's when I like to learn with a coffee, um, you know, in a quiet base measures early in the morning. So I thankfully have a tendency that I don't need that much sleep. Second question. Yes. What are your thoughts on compound movements and how they can affect your joints? What are compound movements? Bench press, when you walk out, or squat, or deadlifts? Yeah, so um, I, I think that um, when uh, kids or young adults do a lot of heavy lifting, it actually does show when they get older that their shoulders are a little bit more arthritic. Um, so it does have effect, not necessarily when you're young. So what we tell our patients is to stress low impact. So I used to do a lot of running, and I can't really run that much anymore because my knees bother me. So I do a lot of cycling because it's a lot easier on my joint. Can you do it? Yes, you can, but you basically have to do it in a way that you don't, uh, you know, put too much stress on your skeleton uh, because it's not going to be something that you have to worry about now. But when you get older, you may have an issue. Yes, what's your name? Uh, Isaac Mendoza. I'm going to come back to you. From where? Phoenix, Arizona. Nice. Okay. My question is, do you do skin grafts? I do do, um, my partners do a little bit more, but we do some basic skin grafts. Um, but if it's a little bit too involved, then we get the plastic surgeons. So sometimes with the big traumas, we have plastic surgeons working with us. Um, but the split thickness skin grafts is uh, what I do occasionally. Um, but a lot of times I have my partner who does a lot more of them. He's a specialist in trauma. Um, and uh, I do trauma surgery, but he, there are specialists in trauma. Same way I was doing, hand, I do hand surgery, but I'm not a specialist in hand, okay? Um, so why do you ask that question? Because uh, I have a skin graft. Very good. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, what's your question? My name is Yossi from here, Los Angeles. Nice. And my question is, my question is, how do they, like, how do you know whether or not to answer that by on Shabbos? Answer what? The call. They call you. Oh, if you're on call, you're going to answer. Anytime they call you, it's from the sort of 
escalates to the level of the emergency room doctor is calling you. I'm not basically, so um, you basically get a call. Let's say there is a hip fracture and a lot of times they are able to basically say you need to get surgery. Hip fractures, unfortunately, when someone gets a hip fracture, there's a 30% mortality. That means they die if they don't have the surgery within a certain time frame. So even though their heart is fine and their lungs are fine, but if they don't get fixed and get up and start walking, they could die. So those are the things that- uh, You said that they called you Friday night and then you went in Travis Day. Travis morning. How does that work? It's not actually an emergency if you call in the next day. True, but the way the world works is it is an emergency because the operating room basically says, you call, I have an emergency, I need to get into the OR. They're like, okay, we have the first case available at 7.30 in the morning. It's emergent because otherwise, if it was basically a very elective surgery, they wouldn't actually let you do a weekend surgery. They're only emergencies generally in most hospitals. Um, but there's urgency, right? Which is basically you're supposed to go in on Chavez for. And sometimes with these discussions, I don't think it's, I think that there is a lot of information about all the laws of Chavez and everything like that. I think what the intent of this conversation is, is to give you a flavor of someone who's sort of uh, in the system who does something that's completely not in the sort of sphere of what you guys have been exposed to. So I think it's important to hear another perspective, um, but the nuts and bolts, there's a lot of gray in this world. So I will basically give you sort of uh, credence. And that is where a lot of people who are thinking about medicine decide that they don't want to do it because there's a lot of, you know, I grapple with it, even though I'm supposed to do it, but oh, there's a lot of areas that, you know, if you speak to one halakhic authority, they'll tell you you should do it, but in a certain way, um, it's interesting. You're allowed to come back from the hospital, okay, on Shabbos. I always wondered that. That's what I thought. But I'm like, only if you're married, because it's showing bias. But if you're single, you're not allowed to come back. It's interesting. Just think about that. All right, next question. Yes. When the board people ask What's your name? I know your name. I want to hear it again. That's your name. There you when go. When the board people ask you how much you make, what was your answer? At the time? Yeah. He's like his father. So <laughs> back then, ten, they... Ten, um, ten what? Well, no, nah, I know his father. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so, so what's funny is that if you go into the basement of a hospital for joint diseases, there is a gym there, and there is a plaque. So my name is on the thing, because at, back then I used to lift a lot. So um, that was 325 pounds, 10 times, bench press. Um, and um, so, so they still call me the strongest hostage there. Um, but that was called the rabbi during residency. That's, that was the name that they gave me, rabbi. Um, I have half smicha. And uh, my grandfather wanted me to finish smicha, and the dean of the medical school wanted me to finish smicha. One of the reasons why I didn't, for better or for worse, is because if you're a rabbi in a medical school environment, um, they're going to consider you to be on the ethical panels, something like you sort of went into that direction. There's a lot of medical, ethical, and as a surgeon, we're very like pragmatic, cut and dry. There's a problem, fix it. Um, medical doctors like to talk about things, hypothesize things. We're all about action. We have to make very difficult decisions with you know, a stressful environment. Um, maybe that's another reason why I do a lot of exercise because it, it's very good for someone to have you know, a, a sort of a, a positive channel to take all their nervous energy or anxiety and to do it. And, and I think you guys are um, doing all that now, but when you're adults, it's very hard to sort of carve out a time for yourself. But I think it, the people who do it have much more balance. Uh, but getting back to that answer, um, uh, in my shul, I lane, I um, give a speech, I um, do a lot of things that other people don't usually do. So actually, in, in shul, they mostly call me rabbi. Uh, but it's not because of a smicha, it's just because of my function. All right, moving down. So that was a good question. <laughs> Yes, what's your name? Metal Tenema. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned the clavicle fracture, is that yeah. the shoulder blade? The, so the shoulder blade is a scapula, right, back here. Mm -hmm. So the clavicle is here, it's an S-shaped bone. So the actual um, plate, if you look at it, this is a small one. So this is basically curved like an S. 
So it lies on top of the bone. There are other ones that go inferior or on the side lateral to it. Um, so it's very specific to the bone, um, but it's not the shoulder blade per se, it's the collarbone, which is right here. Collarbone? Collarbone, collarbone yeah. Yes, back first. <laughs> we're, we're cousins. I see that. Yeah. Um, you said you work on like the joints, right? But do you work on specifically the bone or the cartilage or both? Uh, the whole joint. So the joint is cartilage, bone, ligaments. So I do ACL reconstruction, I do total joint replacements, and I do a lot of other associated surgeries with the knees and hips and shoulders. Now you understand why it takes, like after medical school, it's even a longer training period in just this area. Um, yes. Back to what you were saying, what, what, what would be the advantages or disadvantages of a compound movement or exercise? Like, like the bench, deadlift, or squat? You know, it's all good up until a certain point. If you overdo it, you may be at prone for more injuries. So let's say you do heavy leg lifts that are so heavy that you know, you could basically tear something in the labrum of your hip. And I see these, it's actually not so much of young guys, but young ladies who do a lot of gym exercises, they, 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 they bench or they do stuff huh? more than they should. And their body's not able to, to, to do it. So, um, you know, one of the things that I do, just to give you context, is those questions are really good. And for a physical therapist who actually could tell you exactly what motions and what are you doing and the most effective way to exercise, versus a person who basically goes in if there's an accident or there's a bad injury that needs surgery. So I'm this sort of carpenter. I'm not gonna basically able to answer all your theoretical questions, but I can tell you that people who do bench pressing, that's one of the things I stopped uh, probably 15 years ago, is because, what? <laughs> no, I started downscaling it. But my shoulders started bothering me and I knew from operating a lot of patients with uh, shoulder, uh, arthritis that this was part of their history. They were doing a little bit too much. Now, are there people who could do it and they do it all their life? Absolutely. It's very important to be, you know, fit. Um, you know, it's, um, it, 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 it is critical, but in, like in everything in life, life, there's moderation, right? So if you have moderation, great. But if you don't have moderation, then uh, you could go and injure yourself more. That's it. All right. So we're moving. Uh, you had a question already. I can just go. Yes. Um, Mr. Eldrizen from Carnite. Um, is the like the gore in it something you have to get used to, or something you're always okay with? Um, that's a very good question. I was drawn to it um, when I was um, in. Um, so I went to Yeshiva, and then um, I was doing a smicha program, but I uh, was basically um, getting more and more interested in this area. So I became an EMT. Um, and uh, the EMT calls that I actually loved were the trauma calls, uh, which most of the EMTs couldn't stand. Um, and you know, you wonder what draws someone, it's called Hasidus Tamkamas, it's not really understood, it's uh, hidden. Um, but you know, my grandfather, my great grandfather and his father were all them. so it may be something that's related to that um, in terms of what my father did for many years was a, you know, construction. So there's inherent sort of same, you know, cop of, of what, what that is. Um, but there are, I used to have a program, students who used to come into the OR to shadow. And there was one, uh, you know, student here who actually um, went into the OR multiple times. So it wasn't him, it was someone else who actually, when I did something, I was drilling into the femur, which is part of the knee replacement, they actually fainted. Um, so, you know, it's not uh, surprising that that happens. It's very, um, it's very disturbing to have people see what we do, um, but um, yeah, that's what, that's what I do. Can that um, prevent people from saying it's real? Um, no, a lot of people have the initial reaction and they're able to do it. Um, but most people, I would say, you know, in the population are very, like they see blood, they freak out and everything like that. But I sort of got that, feeling that I was an EMT, we're doing trauma. I, I used to volunteer in the emergency room even before I was in medical school. So you sort of get an idea of, of what you wanna be. And uh, you know, it's very uh, you know, unusual for people to see, you know, my operating room has music, it's very chilled. 
Uh, before Rosh Hashanah, we play Slichas. Not that everybody likes it, but I like to hear the vibe of Rosh Hashanah, so we get into it. When I was a resident, one of the things that, uh, just going back to another story, is that um, one of the uh, head of the hospitals came over to me. He was a, a Jewish guy, and he says, uh, you know, I know you're kosher now, um, but you know, when you decide to go not kosher, I'm gonna take you to the best lobster in New York City. <laughs> so I, I told that story um, at my graduation speech, and I said, you know, um, you know, this is the environment that I came into, but I have to tell you that you guys didn't change me, I changed you guys, because at one point, Matis Yahu, back when he was doing all the sort of King Without a Crown, that album, this is going back probably, you know, close to 20 years ago, we had the entire operating room playing these King Without a Crown, and, you know, things about Hasidus in the operating room, because all the texts, most of them were black, loved that music, and um, so, you know, sometimes you're able to transform your environment as opposed to you getting transformed from that. So that's another story. Um, I'm gonna go get you. Let's, uh, we got 10 minutes, so uh, no repeats. You can come to me afterwards, but uh, we're gonna go, what's your name? Nafi Gurnet from Florida. All right. Um, so two things. Number one, what happens to the police after they're healed? That's a good question. So 90% of them stay in the patients, like you saw the clavicle, um, but sometimes it bothers people. And um, you could offer them to have surgery to remove it. And actually, when I was a resident, I did a, a study. Every resident has to do a, a project. So I looked at, um, it's published. If you Google my last name, you'll see in the orthopedic journal, if you take out these plates, it helps 64% of the patients. Not everybody, you can't say it's gonna be helpful. Uh, but generally these plates are very, uh, what's called bioinert. They're not supposed to interfere at all with the body. They're very contoured to the bone, so it shouldn't really interfere with anything. Um, and they're there for life. So something like this that's put in the femur, unless there's a real reason to take it out, it stays in for life. Okay, so also, um, when you do surgery, do you open, the skin, like on certain ones, always in the bone? That's what we do, yeah. So like, you have to rip the muscle off the bone in order to put a It's a surgery, so it's a very meticulous. We have to make sure you don't damage any nerves, any muscles. So how do you any, get to the bone without damaging muscle? Uh, that's what we call the surgical planes intervals. That's why you spend many, many years learning surgery as part of it. Good question. I mean, but that's that. That's why it takes time. It's not like ten seconds, like what I showed. It's 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 a process. Yes. I'm Joe Burrabin, also from Florida. Have you ever done any surgeries on like big name sports players? Or... Um, I I have I have operated on some big names, but uh, not only I can't say, but um, that's not the area that I actually am interested in doing because you don't really have menucha. You, you're at a beck and call to some VIP. So um, I sort of steered, when I was a fellow, we actually did a lot, we covered a lot of big games. Uh, when I was a resident, we used to cover the Mets and, and things like that. Um, we didn't really have a choice, uh, but, but that's what we did. Um, we did Alvin Ailey. I don't know if you know that uh, in the New York, there is sort of a dance troupe. So we used to basically have rotations. We were the doctors there. So if those dancers injured themselves, we had to go back to the uh, area and, and help them. Good question. All right, moving to you. What's your name? Uh, Shai Sproulin from Fairbanks. Um, What's your father's name? Dylan. Uh, how often would you tell someone that fractured or sprained an ankle or busted their knee or whatever, they should get surgery or they shouldn't? Everyone, every, it's a different case. Every, everyone's different. Sometimes they need MRI. Sometimes they basically have to see what they could do before having surgery. So there's no case that's the same. So that's another reason why this residency is so long. It's not just the skin and you know getting to the surgery, but it's knowing when to operate, okay? And all the steps and all the classifications and everything like that. So, you know, you guys learn yeshiva, you spend a lot of time, but when you're in residency, the amount of learning that you have to do and the amount of testing that you do is so challenging that uh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, and in New York, the pre program that was in was very hard, it was very demoralizing. They literally break you like boot camp. Um, the best compliment I got in five years from one of my professors was saying that doesn't suck after I did a surgery. He looked at it like that doesn't suck. 
So it's just like your idea. They're not into touchy-feely. They're not into making you feel good about yourself. They're into breaking you. And now it's different, but you come out as, you know, a person who basically could go and uh, with very little sleep be able to do things that you could wake up in the middle of the night and just do it because that's part of your DNA. That's part of who you are. Yes? Do surgeons ever sign their name on the bone? So, so what's your name? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so the short answer is, before you go into surgery, you have to take a surgical marker and you have to mark the knee or the shoulder that you're doing. If you do not do that, they cannot move the patient into the room. Once they get into the room before the surgery, they have to make sure, it's a surgical bend, that the, the, the extremity is marked and then you do a timeout. Um, but if someone puts some kind of indentation on the bone of their, I think it would be futile, uh, but that would be basically assault and battery, right? <laughs> you can't do that. So what's interesting, uh, I'll give you a little bit. So when I do certain hardware or certain hips, I know in my practice, this is my hardware, this is how I do the surgery, and I can tell just by the x-ray as that I was a surgeon, just because I do a certain way of surgery. Uh, but you can't do anything that uh, would be extraneous, that would basically, you know, you have to be very careful. I mean, there's a lot of stories I have, I just have to be mindful of everyone's time. So, um, moving on to the next question. We had, uh, what? It's, it's a good question. I, 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 you look familiar, so mostly, I know it used to be like brothers, now it's fathers, now it's even grandfathers. It's kind of funny, but uh, you know, times have changed. What's your name? Joseph Benjamin, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. So I wanted to ask you, if you knew the test um, was on child is five, taking it, why would you go through all the struggle of um, going to college and residency just to be denied? I didn't know. I didn't know. No, and um, one of the things that when I was a, um, a resident, I uh, got I had, so after residency you do a fellowship. So I interviewed in a couple of different spots in the country, pretty uh, rep, you know very very good reputation. So they were interviewing me and they said, well, you know what could you share? And I said I respect my father told me to respect everyone no matter who they are where they come from. And I knew that that made an impression on them. And they wrote that down. Um, then they called me like three months later and I got accepted to their program, but they wanted to see if I would come and. Um, and I knew that program had mandatory rounds, 5 a.m. Uh, Shabbos morning. Whether you're call or not, as a fellow, you had to come in and discuss the cases. Now, we did that in our fellowship on Thursday morning early, before surgery, before our, our day started. But if it was a Shabbos, I'm like, there's, not, there's no chance, no how. Um, back then, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you go into, but you don't know all the details you know, before you get the, you know, into the program. Uh, but when you have the tough and, you know, things like that, if you have something that you really feel that you need to do, you do it. And, uh, you know, things will, you know, God, God will make sure that he will make a path for you. And I think that's one of the things that's really important mm -hmm. to take home from that. Yes? Well, yeah, day, like, um, You're gonna send regards to your father, by the way. I already did. Okay. How many, uh, how many surgeries do you, do you make? So there's, uh, I do, um, there's smaller surgeries, uh, for example, like arthroscopic knee surgery for meniscus there. That doesn't take too long, so I could do uh, five of them or six of them in the morning and then go to office hours. Um, but on a Monday, I do joint replacements and ACL reconstruction, so I usually do four of those surgeries, the big surgeries a day. That, that'll take all day. Half of your office, part of the surgery? Yeah, so half of my, so half my time, I would say not half, but 40% of my time is in the office, 40% of my time is um, uh, you know, surgery, and the other 20% is administrative, so I take care of a lot of uh, stuff within Kaiser, so uh, I, like today is administrative day, that's why I'm able to come by in the middle of the day. So you said you wake up four o'clock in the morning, could you give us your outline of your schedule? Yeah, so I get up really early, um, I exercise, uh, usually 90 minutes minimum, I dive in, I go to work, and every day it's a little bit different. So I could be going into surgery, I could go into office hours, I could have meetings. Um, so every day, the nice thing about being what I do as opposed to going to 
a regular medical doctor that you see patients every day, let's say from nine to five, is we start earlier, um, sometimes we end later, sometimes we end earlier, um, but you have a little bit more flexibility. Um, one of the things that's uh, difficult is that you could go in um, in a typical day, um, but there's an emergency that comes up, and all of a sudden all the plans that you had to go out with your friends at night, blah, blah, that changes on a dime. So you have to get used to that, and um, that's something that's very challenging if you're you know, trying to balance work life. Um, but um, that's one of the things that I, part of Kaiser, I suppose, private practice is that when it comes to young to tall and all those things, I don't want to think about work. I take all those times off. Um, that's a good question. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, Last question. You operate here in, in LA? Yeah. So I live here. So I live in the Sherman Oaks. So what? why did you switch from New York to here? My wife told me she wants to move next to her sister, so here I am. <laughs> it's that simple. Because her sister lives in the valley, I live in the valley. Valley is the best place in the world. Yeah. Jets, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so when people say, why don't you live in the city? For me, I lived in, for five years in Manhattan. So that's a city to me, not LA. LA is not a city. LA, he'll tell you, LA is suburb, whatever. It's not a city. Uh, Manhattan is a city. But, um, you know, it's really an honor to uh, share all my experiences with you, or I should say some of them. And um, you know, thank you for really listening and uh, appreciate it.